Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our Laser City Bite. Today we are going to talk about Laser City, and for this, I have with me Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm the outreach manager for Laser City and a researcher with SETI Institute in Interstellar. And this is the famous Dr. Franck Marchies. <laughs> And I'm a researcher at the SETI Institute, astronomer and director of the citizen science at Unistellar for the SETI Institute. So, uh, Laser SETI, what's new with this? There is a lot of really wonderful news with Laser SETI. So, um, up until two weekends ago, there were two Laser SETI observatories, one in Hawaii and one in California. And last weekend, we installed the third Laser SETI observatory in Sedona, Where? Arizona. Sedona, Arizona. Yes, it was wow. beautiful and hot. Yes, and it was an adventure, so we went there with the stations. Yes. Well, we sent the station first and we joined the stations later on, and we put them on the roof of a facility and uh, install, align, set them up. Are they taking data? Are they taking data? No. And the only reason for that is because the Arizona night sky happened to be a little too cloudy while we were out there. So we need to basically go back um, and focus them and make some minor adjustments as well. Um, but other than that, everything should be up and running in the next month. Yeah. So it's almost ready and it was a good adventure. Uh, we it was. <laughs> we discovered that Lauren knows how to uh, tie bolts and... Um... I also discovered this. I didn't previously <laughs> know it. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to talk about laser study for those who may be joining for the first time or want to know a little bit more in honor of this new installation. Um, so we'll be looking now at about 30% of the sky, whereas before we were looking at about 19% of the sky. And if you don't know, the goal of laser study is to do optical study on all the sky, all the time. All the time. So optical SETI, what we mean by optical SETI is to search and detect and characterize a laser pulse. So the assumption is that if a civilization is more advanced than us, they may have built those gigantic lasers to be able to communicate with themselves, with the stations, or maybe just to tell us they are here. And uh, we will basically be able to detect those laser pulse using these stations. And the way that we would be able to detect them is essentially with each laser study station, light comes in, there's a grating that basically splits light from any stars or anything else on, on the field. And star light is, of course, made of many different wavelengths of light. So when we split that light, we see a whole rainbow. Um, with a laser, it's only one wavelength. So that rainbow wouldn't appear. That's how we would be able to detect a laser pulse versus light from natural sources, because it would just be one monochromatic um, source of light. Yeah. And it would be obvious. Uh, right now, we have the, the pipeline to do this analysis isn't being built. And uh, the processing works. The detection is not yet fully implemented, but it will be in the future as we have more and more stations uh, ready to observe the sky. OK. so. Detecting lasers, great. So, but why a civilization would be using lasers? What, uh, what exactly we, we expect to, uh, to detect? So there's a couple different reasons why a civilization would use lasers. Um, one would be communication, of course. So you can pack a lot of information into a laser beam. Um, and they may be using lasers to communicate with each other, to send messages to us, or to kind of make their own cosmic internet, so to speak. So do yeah. you want to talk about that idea a little bit? Yes, so the cosmic internet, the idea is that if a civilization is, as for instance, uh, being spread itself into different planetary systems, uh, they may want to exchange information, like uh, the encyclopedia, or just saying hi to each other from time to time. Um, the vast distance will make this difficult in time, but also we need to have extremely powerful lasers to be, do, to be able to do this. So with this idea that a, such a civilization <clears throat> will basically build relay and use stars to communicate with each other. So they will basically put a, a spacecraft at a specific distance, which is the focus of the star system, and this station will be able to uh, receive the light from um, 
from the another station, amplify it, and send it back to another to another direction. So you can imagine that they will have multiple um, to to send a message from A to B. Instead of doing a straight line, they will basically try to find stars a specific location and have a station that will receive the the signal, amplify it, use the um, use the star to get send it back uh, to an, in another direction. So that's what we call a cosmic internet. I don't know if that's a name that anybody <laughs> uses, but that's the way I, I describe it. They may not be using <laughs> the, the ET may not. Um, but there's a lot of different reasons that, of course, a, a lot of different ways of communicating that would essentially use lasers um, as far as extraterrestrial intelligence goes. Yeah, and, so go uh, go, the, did we see uh, have we been searching for these kind of lasers before? Yes, yes, we absolutely have. Um, so a lot of study uh, research and, and searches have occurred in the radio and in the optical regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And as far as optical study searches goes, um, this is not the first, but this is, laser study is not the first, but it's the first all sky, all the time survey that we're building right now. Other different searches have been a little bit more refined. Um, so there was a paper that came out last year, um, Marcy and Trellis, um, and they essentially looked for, they, they looked around the galactic plane, about two-thirds of the galactic plane, searching for different signals that could indicate laser pulses from other civilizations. So how um, many stars did they observe? Um, thousand, something like that? I want to say around 5,000. Okay, 5,000 um, stars. So... But in our galaxy, there is 400 billion stars. Yes, okay? exactly. There's so it quite looks a lot. like a big number, but in fact, this is a tiny grain of salt into the into the search. So they have been looking at spectrum taken from the stars to look for monochromatic emission from laser emission. Exactly. And one thing, they observe a few stars, 5,000 of them, and they observe for a short period of time. Because basically to record those spectra, we're recording, in, I would say, in 10 minutes to one hour, and that's all. You can imagine that if a advanced civilization has the, such a cosmic internet, they will face the same problem that we have, the lack of energy. Right. If, you, if you want to send a 100 gigawatt um, laser beam, continuous laser beam, in a specific uh, um, uh, in the direction, you basically every four minutes need to find the same amount of energy that uh, an, a small atomic bomb. So it's that's a, lot of, a lot of energy. Yes, exactly. So probably they're not using this every day. Probably they're using from time to time a specific moment when they need to communicate uh, very important information. So the search that this group did is great, but it's not all the time. It's only for it's one hour only. Right, it's not all the time, and it did it did find I think eleven potential candidates um, for some sort of you know unnatural laser pulse that was occurring from ET, but each of those was disproved, and essentially they found them to be M type stars, Wolf Rayet stars. Um, I think a spacecraft in one instance, uh, not a spacecraft, but an aircraft in one instance. Okay. Um, so there's you know we, we are finding candidates, but they're unconfirmed, or we find later that they are from natural or expected phenomenon. And so far, in all of these optical study searches that we've done, there's been no concrete evidence of a laser to be detected, which is also why it's so important to have something that's observing the sky all the time. Um, in case, just as Frank was saying, those communications are not constant coming from ET civilizations that require a lot of energy. You want to do that in really specific times. We need to be watching the sky all of the time in order to actually catch these things, if okay. they exist. There is another very exotic way to communicate, which is quantum communication. Yes, yes there so is. So we're going to have a very special city bite on this topic, but I just want to mention this is very advanced technology, yes. because we don't really know yet how to do it. There was like three papers published in uh, Nature, I think, uh, last month showing communication using quantum um, between different parts of a city and different parts of, uh, of countries. So it's extremely new. There's something new that we're basically just learning to do 
And the idea in this case is to basically use quantum entanglement between two photons mm -hmm. to send information. I don't know if we're going to be able to detect this kind of stuff. We're going to sure. talk about this in the future, but that's a very, that's a very interesting um, new technology to do, co to do communication between, uh, between stars. And there's even other, like we were talking about communication with lasers, you can use lasers for other things, or ET may use lasers for other things. So they may use it in the way that they travel um, through beamed energy propulsion. So, so what do they do? They ride photons? They do ride photons. They ride beams of light. That's exactly what we're talking <laughs> I about. I can see that's it's my dream. <laughs> it's a great sci-fi. We should pitch this to Netflix. Um, so no, what did they do? What did they do more seriously? Essentially, using lasers to propel themselves into into space. So you could maybe think of a spacecraft with a light sail or oh, okay. some sort of similar. Um, the star, similar star shot project of exactly. uh, breakthroughs. Exactly. Um, exactly. Exactly. And you would use a laser to propel. That spacecraft into space but there is multiple reasons to see lasers from et, from ET. through mm -hmm. travel through communication and maybe through some other exotic reasons that we can't really think of um, and we cannot really think of them because we don't did not detect them so exactly that's exactly. the reason we're doing this research we find laser beam we probably try to understand what these laser beams are in terms of the composition they contain the signal or anything like this and we find out that maybe they use those laser beams to do something that we did not expect. Exactly. We will see that. But we need first to search for that. And that's what we're doing today. Okay. Um, there is also some scientific study we can do uh, with laser SETI that are not related to radiance. Um, can you give me uh, one example, for instance? So because we'd be observing all the sky all the time, we'll catch any exciting things that happen to occur. So. For instance, meteors um, fragmenting or heading towards whatever laser study station happens to be observing them, you'd be able to see that meteor brightening. Okay. So like we're talking about natural, natural phenomena. phenomena, rocks entering into the atmosphere mm -hmm. and burning into the atmosphere. Exactly. And you call that meteors, they can be fireball if they're to be bigger, right. fragmented bullets. Etc. And with this instrument, we will be able to see the brightest one. Mm -hmm. And since we're doing spectroscopy, on the top of seeing them, detecting them, we will be also able to characterize them in terms of getting information about the temperature, for instance, the evolution in terms of brightness and color, which are indicative of the composition of this, uh, the, the body itself, the meteors, the asteroid itself. So. We're going to see that, but we're also going to see non-natural objects. Yes. Like so Satellites? Satellites, uh, debris re-entering the atmosphere from launches, um, interesting different man-made phenomena like yeah. that. Yeah, because we launch a lot of rockets, as you probably know now, and uh, some of them come back to Earth, thanks SpaceX has this kind of uh, technology, but a lot of them, they just stay in orbiting around our planet for a long period of time. Sometimes it's the satellite itself, and sometimes it's the second stage of the rocket. Mm -hmm. And they have very complex orbit, and we lose them. I mean, it's been, a, there's a lot of uh, discussion at, on this topic at the moment. You know? Exactly. So there's a lot that we can see by observing all the sky all the time, whether it's through, you know, natural phenomenon, um, everything from meteors to lasers the from ET. And there is one thing I want to say that is not, uh, it's really back to, to, uh, to maybe SETI. Uh, we'll be observing all the sky all the time, and maybe we see some variation in the sky that we did not expect. I mean, there was this idea that there is some vanishing stars. Mm. I don't know if you heard about that, where basically uh, some stars have disappeared or changed kind of brightness so much that they're undetectable. So with this survey, because we, we expect to run it for years, decades probably, we're going to record a large amount of data and we'll be able to see the, those variations of light over a long period of time. And that's something that very few observatories have been able to do. Mm -hmm. So similar to how we all got really excited about Betelgeuse for a little bit. Yeah. And the vanishing stars, uh, we don't really know where they are. Uh, there is the idea that there could be Dyson sphere uh, being built by extraterrestrial civilizations. And you can learn about those in our other video. Yes, if you don't know what that. a Dyson sphere is. 
<laughs> okay. Um, anything else? Um, I think that pretty much covers it. I think that one thing to just remember while we talk about laser study, and we'll continue to go a little bit deeper into each of these topics that we talked about today in, in this video series, um, but one of the reasons that we look specifically for lasers, even though we can see meteors and, and debris and, and things like that, is because there's no known sources of lasers created naturally in space. So there's things called masers, yeah. which are similar. Um, if you don't know, laser stands for light amplification by simulated emission of radiation. It's, that's why we say laser yes, <laughs> instead of secret. that whole thing. Um, but a maser is basically the same thing, but with microwaves instead of optical light. Um, so those are created naturally in, in space through a lot of different mechanisms from planetary atmospheres to molecular clouds, um, but not so for optical that's monochromatic right. lasers. So that's why we're looking for these and why it would be such an interesting find for SETI as a whole if we could could catch one of these. Because it would be a very easy proof of existing technology, extraterrestrial technology. Or new science that or nobody science. has discovered before. And that's even more interesting. Yeah, exactly. Not more, but as, as interesting. Differently interesting. Okay. Well, that's all for today. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. And, and we'll see, see you soon. Bye. See you next time. Bye.